You're about to learn about Wilmington's unicorn. The term unicorn was coined in 2013 to describe the rare species of privately held technology companies valued at more than $1 billion. Unicorns were rare even in Silicon Valley, so you can imagine how unlikely it was to spot one in Wilmington. But now we've got one. Encino, which spun out of Live Oak Bank in 2012, has raised more than $150 million from investors and is now valued at more than $1 billion. Around the time Encino was getting going, I remember walking through the old Wachovia Mortgage Building the second in, in Mayfair. The second and third floors were completely empty, 40,000 square feet of empty space. I wondered how long it was going to take to fill it. Fast forward to today, Encino occupies the entire building. Plus, they had to have Steve Anderson build them another building at the nearby offices of Mayfair. The next thing I expect to hear is that they're evicting Harris Teeter and they're going to take over that space. <laughs> Encino is now a global business, headquartered in Wilmington, with nearly 600 employees. Encino CEO Pierre Nade is with us today to talk about how they achieved such phenomenal growth and where they're going from here. Pierre will be interviewed on stage today by Vicki Janowski, the Business Journal editor. If you have a question today for Pierre, please text it in to the number that's on slips of paper at your table. It's 910-264-8955. Make sure you include your name and table number with the text. We'll get a microphone to as many people as possible so you can ask your questions directly to our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Pierre and Vicki. Thank you, Rob. So last year, Pierre and I were talking for an interview um, that we did for the Wilmington Biz magazine. And at that check-in, we were talking about the phenomenal growth and everything they're working on. But I feel like even six months ago that that's probably outdated at this point. Um, I feel, as Rob mentioned, we've got um, employees that have expanded into a new building. I get constant Google alerts, notifications about new bank deals that they're doing, many of which are in Europe and as far away as Australia. And uh, they continue to land on best places to work list. So I thought today, before we get into uh, how they've managed such rapid growth and what they've done here in Wilmington, and also what they're going to be planning for for the future, we do just another kind of check-in uh, here to start things off and just say, you know, what, what is it uh, that you guys are working on now and, and where are you at? Yes, so um, <clears throat> we have two strategic initiatives. Uh, by the way, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate the effort. And um, this community has been fantastic to us. I want you to know that to start a company here, in the very beginning, people would question the wisdom to do that. Can you find the skill sets? Can you find the people? And to be quite frank, I was skeptical myself. I was living in Atlanta at the time where there's lots of people and you can start a company there. And I came here and to me the most pleasant surprise was the numbers and the quality of the people we could find here. Um, just to give you some idea, uh, today we have over 200 people that graduated from UNCW as employees out of 621. Um, we receive about 1,500 resumes per quarter, mm. and we would hire <clears throat> between 60 and 90 every quarter. Um, just to give you an idea of the magnitude and the low percentages of people that actually come through. Uh, but we always tell people, keep on trying, because it may just not be the right spot at that time. But the quality of people we found here was phenomenal. And that's actually helped us with the growth. We have two strategic initiatives that we're focused on right now. The first one was international expansion and truly getting to the market over there, which is Europe, Australia, uh, and Toronto, Canada. And then um, the other one is to expand the product set from commercial loan origination out into the deposit side, into customer onboarding. So in a nutshell, today what Encino would do is to focus on when you go to a bank to onboard the customer, it's the first time you do business with a bank, to make any loan type you want to make and to make any deposit type of account opening, like a CD, a savings account, a debit card, credit card, etc. All of these things used to be fairly cumbersome processes. And what the cloud has allowed us to do is to make that a very fluent, easy process that actually matches consumer expectations and experiences as you would do on Amazon or any retail website. <clears throat> so those two strategic focus points is expand into the retail side of the bank and expand internationally. And they're going very well. The cloud, we should talk about that a little bit without going too far into the weeds. But when you guys started 
with this idea and this concept of cloud-based banking. You know, was it a difficult sell, particularly when we're talking about you know, banking and security of, of, of finances? In 2012, we would go to the Georgia Bankers Association and the gentleman that spoke right before us actually made an hour-long passionate plea to the banks never to use the cloud. <laughs> and so when I got on, I said, this must be a joke or a setup, OK? Um, it wasn't funny at the time because you needed some customers. But the bottom line is, um, you know, in the end, the cloud is just another data center. And it really is about the security practices of the cloud provider you select. And as you know, we selected Salesforce.com, which is well known for the trust factor, their security, and the amount of money they spend on the security around that cloud. And if you step back and look at what they do to secure the cloud, no single bank can ever match the sophistication and the spending. So it was difficult in the beginning, but once you overcome that resistance and the market momentum kicks in, then all of a sudden, you've got a leg up on the competition because now they're trying to catch up. And over time, when people start realizing the benefits, the RFPs that comes out actually requires the cloud to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And then for a while, you've got this position where you're almost the only one going after the business. And then, of course, the competition starts catching up, which is happening. So we just have to keep ahead of the pack. Is that one reason why you guys are going um, so aggressively after international uh, markets? It's very interesting. If you speak to Europeans, they will tell you innovation happens in the west case of the US. It takes between three and five years for that innovation to mature and reach the east coast. Then it may take three to five years to get to the UK and then slowly jump across the channel into Europe. Okay? And I thought in the beginning, well, it can't be really true because you know, Germany is a fairly sophisticated economy, etc. But as we go in there, it's amazing to see that it's actually true. It's not really a 10-year lag, but there is a significant lag between the adoption and the comfort level of these new technologies. On some areas, uh, Europe is ahead, for instance, uh, P2P payments, um, the use of cell phones and payments, et cetera, touchless cards, and so on. But in other elements, like massive infrastructure, uh, we still have to refight. Uh, evangelizing the cloud and actually convincing people it's safe. And it's happening. It's coming ahead uh, pretty fast now. So where are you guys focused at right now globally? <clears throat> so we've got an office in London um, with 40 people. And, and that office is focused on mostly Western Europe, your big countries like France, Germany, the UK, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and the Nordics. Um, <clears throat> we are studying entry into Japan to begin to understand what that means and what the investment will be. And we've got an office in Sydney, Australia, uh, to do Asia Pacific up there. And then we've got people in Toronto, Canada, and in the US and Canada. We were talking about this a little bit at lunch, but how, your frequent flyer miles are pretty. Um, that is not something I'm proud of. Uh, <laughs> but, but yes, um, I am the highest status you can find on American and Delta. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and one other thing, Rob mentioned this, but we want to get to as many questions from the audience um, as, as we can, too. And um, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to you guys in a minute, see what you want to ask here. Um, and the phone numbers, again, are on your tables, but it's 910-264-8955 if you want to text them in. Um, and we'll see what you have. But just one other, just uh, kind of check in on where you guys are currently in your status. You know, let's talk a little bit about that employment base. You guys are moving into the new building. Are you, con are you seeing continue growth in your hiring, or have you guys leveled off right now? No, we hire about 150 to 200 per year. Um, and I foresee this year um, to do about the same. If you look at that 620 employees, about 520 is uh, in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. We've got a few remote employees in the US on the West Coast, and then 50 years in Europe and Australia. Uh, so we'll keep on adding at that pace. Um, while you're a growing company, you truly have to focus on innovation and stay out of the pack, okay? There is a point in these software companies that you mature and you start changing the company from a high growth environment to what I would say more of a medium growth environment and you start focusing on EBITDA and profitability. And that's where that hiring will start tailoring off as a percentage. It doesn't mean we'll hire less than 150 people, we'll just hire a smaller percentage of 1,000 people, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't see that yet. The landscape of product development for us is massive. 
And um, we believe that the company is positioned to actually be the core or the nucleus of a much larger company okay. as opposed to building it to be sold. Um, so if you have that mindset, you put an infrastructure in place to actually start accumulating assets around you as opposed to the opposite. Okay. Okay, Rob, do we have questions? Uh, first question is Todd, table 47. Was curious to know what your biggest marketing challenges in 2019 and beyond are. <clears throat> the biggest marketing challenge, um, I would say to us was establishing the brand in Europe uh, from a totally unknown startup out of the US. Um, number one and number two, to start convincing clients that we've perfected the commercial side of the bank we can do the same on the retail side. Um, those two are significant um, strategic bridges you have to cross because there's many companies who become successful with one point solution and they don't have the patience or the capital to actually build out the holistic infrastructure and architecture to go across. So if you think about the European business, you know, we have to support 46 languages. Uh, in Japan, you need double byte characters, which is a complex character set. Um, and we have to code to that and actually enable the software to work. We have to support multi-currency. So building that in the lab here and then taking it overseas and actually prove that it can actually work and function is quite significant. Um, but, but I'm beginning to see the early signs that those, both of those initiatives are paying off. And then just on the regulatory side, you have to change, I mean, within each country, even within Europe, I imagine. That's got to be a challenge. Um, you know, again, Europe is, is one place, but it isn't, okay? And, um, you know, just like in the U.S., every regulator by every region believes they know something better, and then they will tweak and change it. Uh, so in the end, the way we've built the software is not to hard code regulations into the software, mm -hmm. but actually to allow it to be configured to reflect the compliance environment of the specific institution. Okay. And that's one of the reasons of the success we're having. Okay, next question. Next question is uh, from Tom, table 49. Is it on? All right, I'll, I'll, I got it in the text. I'll ask it for you. Actually, it's two, two, different two different questions. One is, uh, how are you incorporating blockchain within your business? And then separately, uh, would Brexit uh, impact your European strategy? Yes. Um, so, so just, yeah, blockchain is number one. And then number two, I, uh, I've been reading recently that there's uh, a lot of banks out of, uh, out of Britain or London are actually reallocating their employees out of Britain because of Brexit and putting them more into the um, other Europe Euro nations. So I was just curious if that's something you're looking into or is that something you're, uh, what's your strategy in that perspective? And then the other question, of course, is uh, with blockchain, how is that, uh, what is your strategy with blockchain within your business and, uh, and whether or not it's, it's, uh, you feel it's feasible? Uh, yes, uh, obviously we track blockchain pretty close to understand the applicability to what we do today. Um, <clears throat> and uh, right now we are, don't have any plans to go in production with blockchain. We obviously tinker in the lab with it and see what it does. Uh, we are in close connection with people who's actually building on blockchain to understand that. Um, I would say blockchain's biggest challenge today is scalability um, in a very high transaction environment. Um, and realize Encino plays in much more bigger, transformative workflow environments of complex processes. Blockchain is designed for a high volume transaction and contracting on an instantaneous basis of transaction processing, okay? So we track it to see applicability, but today we're not actually planning to deploy anything in that field. <clears throat> the second thing about Brexit is um, can you ever have believed that the Britons would make such a mess? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing to see the ugly side of democracy, okay? But um, I'm sure they will get to the right end point. Um, it is frustrating to see how it's dragging on and what's happening there, but here's what we do. <clears throat> There's a big enough market 
in the UK to support the people we've got there. So I'm not concerned that we're overpopulating London. Um, to start off in a foreign place like that, you take some people from here and you put them there and you get some people with language skills and that's why we pick London. <clears throat> Our secondary option is to go to Amsterdam. Um, the Dutch are known to be very flexible and you can take uh, somebody from the Netherlands into France and Germany quite easily, but it's a lot more complex to take a Frenchman into Germany or vice versa. Okay, so you have to look at the cultural connections. So our plan is as a backup is to go into the Netherlands and establish another office and service Europe from there if it becomes problematic. Um, I must say I'm hopeful that they will solve uh, the problem in the next three months, I believe the next date is coming up shortly. But that's the backup plan. Uh, next question is from Lori, table 33. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Lori Plant with CCI Consulting. Can you describe the secret sauce that, fo that fosters the culture of innovation? Um, you know, that's a very interesting question because <clears throat> whenever you speak to an employer, they will always tell you their people are the biggest asset, okay? And then the question is when you talk to the employees, what you find is that there's 55,000 rules and they get put in a box and that they truly have to do what the boss tells them. And um, as a fairly rogue immigrant, I always had this theory that like, wait a minute, what if I let the kids loose and see what happens, okay? And so from day one at Encino, um, when we had seven employees, I put up a big sign in the room we had, which was smaller than the stage, to say this is Encino, Worldwide headquarters, okay? And it was kind of a joke. But um, the point is you planted the seed, we're gonna be big, and we all have to think like that. And then secondly, uh, every individual we hired in the early days, we made it 100% clear that there will be no retribution if you make a mistake. We all make mistakes, just go for it. You can do anything in front of the customer as long as you can explain to me afterwards you thought what you're doing was in the best interest of the client, okay? And as far as innovation goes, <clears throat> the freedom of thought, and there are no silly thoughts. So if you look at our values on the website, respect each other, have fun, okay? Make somebody else's day. It's all about human interaction. In technology, there's a concept where you get very smart people who dominate the room, and then the rest of them kind of follow around. And that concept in our industry is called a competent jerk, okay? <laughs> And, the, and, and, and this is actually very serious and true, is that what you have to do in these innovation cultures is to actually stamp that out. You remove those people, they change their attitude or they can't work there. And because once you get more of an egalitarian innovation mindset, what everybody feels, even if you're two months out of college, you've learned something, your mind means something, and you're actually an intelligent human being, and we hired you for your brain and your ideas. That culture will then feed on itself. And today in Encino, you'll find there's 621 thinking people, as opposed to the management team, and then 610 is actually running around taking orders, okay? And I believe so much in that, that every quarter we reinforce all the values. We've got a three-week onboarding program where you come from a different company, you go through this whole program. Because people are skeptical whether this is true, and it takes him about three months to really get it and understand that we expect them to start thinking outside the box and actually innovate and come up with ideas. Yeah, I know um, you mentioned the work culture. Source Media <coughs> named you guys the number one fintech to work for this year on their list. So what's it been like? Or what are some of those challenges you've had in terms of managing such rapid growth? You know, it's been about seven years-ish, but in some ways it must feel like it's been overnight. Um, so we have very simple concepts as we think about people. If you think of my role, if I can hire seven to ten of the very best in the industry to report directly to me, each of them is going to have seven to ten people working for them. And then as you go down the pyramid, I mean that's just the way the organization works, okay? And so we've got this concept of the family portrait. And everyone who becomes a supervisor at Encino understand that they are not the boss of anybody else. What they are is a supervisor to remove obstacles to make those people successful, okay? And that culture 
is what we drive home to everyone who's got the responsibility and the privilege to manage people. <clears throat> and so once you've got that culture inbred into the whole organization, I literally will walk around and I will ask somebody, tell me about your family picture. That's the seven people that worked for them, okay? And as they explain it, they always start with the five rock stars they got. And then by number six, you probably have somebody newer that's still picking up. And number seven may be a problem child, okay? And you can literally see how they wane off to this one and they go, well, and then, we, and I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're gonna fix it. It's either training, we misplaced the person. Typically, it's a mistake we made, okay? We've either promoted somebody too fast, etc. But if we truly have a problem, let's solve it. Because the teams know it too. Everybody knows when there's a problem. You know, a buddy of mine, Scott Custer, always says, there are no difficult decisions. There's just uncomfortable ones, okay? And you know the answer. So that family portrait concept truly make culture the responsibility of every supervisor and every NCNO employee. And that's how you have to drive it. It can't be something coming out of HR and seven values that sounds like it's very corporate and formal. I mean, the kitchens don't think like that today, okay? So you have to make it something personal, something they can connect to, and then if they see the senior management's behavior actually reflect that, they will actually embrace it. And then that's just what we, we try to practice what we preach. Do you have any hard lessons uh, along the way with all the managing <clears throat> that, that growth and keeping that culture? Um, I would say the lessons is that um, culture is not, uh, to me, a luxury. You're either about culture or you're not. You either believe your people add value or you're not. So if you look at the three things we have to focus on, it's our people, it's your shareholders, and our customers. Our belief is if we take care of the people and the customers, the shareholders will be very happy in the end, which obviously is happening in our case. So, <clears throat> Um, you know, some of the lessons is that maintain your structures, be honest with your people, always be open, make sure you over communicate. That is a phrase I cannot overemphasize. Over communicate. Be very transparent. Where's the company? Where are we struggle? We just launched a product. Maybe it's not going as well as we thought, okay? Tell it to the people. They're thinking. They, they come up with the ideas and the solutions as opposed to a top down structure. So that's what I've learned over my career is probably. The, the most beneficial um, advice I can give somebody. So now when you're recruiting this workforce and you said a good number of them are still coming locally and from the, the graduates here, and when you're trying to get talent from, from outside, what are some of the, the feedback that you're hearing? Either that reasons that they want to move to Wilmington or things you think the community still has a ways to improve upon, you know, whether it's infrastructure or more things to do or diversity in the professional uh, workforce that the feedback that you guys hear in terms of why people might not want to come to Wilmington? Um, so, so the two obstacles we typically see is somebody is concerned if it doesn't work out for whatever reason, is there another technology company to go work for? Because it's a major, I have to move my family again. That's number one. And the second thing is spousal employment. You know, you bring somebody in, they both agree, they are well, well qualified, and where does the wife go? So we actually, have a fairly large number of couples working at the company. Mm. It just happens that way. Um, but I'm very happy to see how the technology space is developing here um, and, and also the other industries so that we actually can accommodate it. Um, I would say the, the, the biggest feedback are those two, spousal employment and you know it's moving here and what if something goes wrong. Um, but we actually put our recruitment group inside marketing not inside HR, for the simple reason. On day one, I realized <clears throat> this place has got a phenomenal lifestyle and benefits to offer. And what you should market and recruit for is not Encino, the entity. It's actually the town, the community. You can live on the beach. You're only two hours from Raleigh. You know, this is a fantastic lifestyle, good people, a decent cost of living, especially if you compare it to the West Coast, etc. And once you start putting that job in that whole package, and you include Wilmington as a big piece, that's why we get this number of applicants. I think that's um, a pretty part of the secret recipe. Interesting. Okay, Bob, do we have any other audience questions? Uh, next question's from Paul, table 41. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul Lawler, Wilmington City Council. I'm delighted to hear you mention the idea of 
marketing what we have here, our quality of life, and those sorts of things. Um, but we'd like to see more Encinos. We'd like to see more Live Oak Banks, more Quips, more Untapped. Uh, do you have any other suggestions of what we can do to encourage more startups in the Wilmington area? You know, it's interesting. I mean, there's the whole incubator <clears throat> idea going on. Um, and as you know, Chip Mayan is a fantastic entrepreneur and he's, he's flying around creating more of these things. And he's actually moving some of them. Aperture has moved to Wilmington and there's more to come, I believe. Um, <clears throat> in the end, success will feed of itself. And, and my belief is what's going to happen is Encino will go public one day, hopefully. Um, some of the younger people will make lots of money. They'll walk across the street and start a new company because there's a thousand ideas. The question is going to be capital, okay? You typically need an office. You need rocket fuel, which is how do you get this thing up and running? Okay, you need money. And the more Wilmington is exposed to the private equity scene, and as Chip and Neil is going on, bringing more of that in, I believe it's going to happen. The momentum is there. And Sino was one of those first places just to get the thing moving. Um, <clears throat> I would say one thing. As I look around the country, you would never have told me Chattanooga has got a big development community. And it's because they put a massive internet pipe in there. One of the things companies look at is actually the, the, the pipe breadth of the internet. Can you actually handle massive data coming down here? Um, and I would say the communications infrastructure we need, if I was a government employee and I could do anything to assist the businesses, it's to actually improve the infrastructure of communications and the internet. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm just a firm believer in private enterprise and, and the business will take care of itself and grow. Um, we have found an extremely friendly <clears throat> environment in the city here, as well as the county. And so just to piggyback off of Councilman Lawler's uh, question, you know, you're here today talking about how much growth you guys have seen. Aperture's president, Chris Cox, spoke at um, UNCW's Business Week last night. And I know the Live Oak uh, bank team, you know, they're hosting banks this week for the uh, Live Oak Ventures equity funding where they're trying to invest yes. in fintech um, enterprises. So w if Wilmington were to look at its, its future in, in the tech world or where it could continue to push or, you know, which direction to take it, organically we've already had this uh, if you added all the jobs up already, and if you consider Live Oak Bank a fintech company, which you know, I kind of do, even though it's a bank, it's a non-traditional bank, you know, is that a natural area for this community to grow in, in terms of being a fintech hub, kind of like what Charlotte has positioned itself as? Typically what you'll find is these things have a way to attack ancillary markets. In other words, if I have a knowledge of banking, I may go to insurance. Uh, or wealth, etc. So what you'll find is because the knowledge is there and then as people jump across the street to start new companies, it'll grow out of that. Uh, as you look at PPD, there's a large number of similar companies in the area as well, not as big, but it's exactly what happened with that one. Mm. So I truly believe it is all about finding that nucleus, getting it to be successful and then go around that. And I think um, with Chip Mayhan's efforts with Canopy and Live Oak Bank, you can see an acceleration of that. And as you guys, as a spin-off, how does that work in terms of, I know there's regulatory controls um, of making sure that you guys are, are separated and considered as separate entities, and there's that firewall there. But in terms of, especially when you were first starting or, or talking to clients of prospective banks, knowing that some of those banks are competing in the same space that Live Oak is, how does that you know, uh, play out in terms of creating your own identity <coughs> as a spin-off? Yes, um, so to so realize Live Oak Bank traditionally used to be an, a government uh, SBA lender. Um, so it is a very niche market. So as we expanded the product set to actually be more of a commercial lending solution and then into retail, they don't really compete with banks in that. Um, and then secondly, the bank is not big enough to really impact you know, Bank of America or Wells Fargo or any of the other large banks or even your community banks that sit in Tennessee, Oklahoma, et cetera. So we sell nationwide. And um, it's more of a showcase, so it's never been a negative to us. It's yeah. actually a big positive. Chip is a well-known guy. Um, and Live Oak is a leader in the, on the technology front. So we've never seen any negatives from it. Okay. Um, but it did, they did come in in 2014 and actually drew a hard line about the separation of the two companies you say by they, the government. The, 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 the government, regulators? yeah, okay. regulators. And, 
Next question is William, table 27. Hey guys, William Brown. I'm actually an engineering student at uh, UNC Charlotte. And going into trying to pursue my own business ventures, get a lot of negativity from colleagues and family members. Oh. You know, why, it's just not normal. Why aren't you using your degree to pursue that in plain simple? It's not going to produce something I can pass on to generations. So my question is, how did you deal with negativity that you received and how will your future generations benefit from the success that you're having today? Um, it, it's interesting. So realize I was um, just over 50 when we started this. So I minimized my risk. I made some money before I started this. <laughs> so, the, and I did it the additional way. I worked for big companies and, and, and made enough where I felt I could take the risk. And, and I'm not kidding. It literally was like that because my big risk was moving to the US when I was 29 years old, which my parents said exactly what they're telling you. Why would you go there and why would they hire you? And I thought, well, I'm going to show them, OK, that this can work. And I will tell you, America is by far the, the most dynamic meritocracy you can ever imagine. Don't watch TV. Just focus on what you want to do, OK, and go for it. Um, and trust me, you'll find more support than you can ever imagine from the people outside. Uh, <clears throat> as I look at starting up a business, it really is, is your idea somewhat unique? And that's quite important, otherwise you're just another one, OK? The second one is really, really, really focus on the customer. Um, that makes a big difference. The third one is the need for capital. Understand the capital requirements. We were very lucky in the sense that um, Chip had the right contacts and had the right backers for us from day one to say, you have access to unlimited capital. So think big and dream big. This is not a lifestyle company. We are going to build a global company. <clears throat> and that actually removed the restraints so that we could think outside the box. So if I were you, I would start thinking about what is the capital requirements of this, OK? There is nothing bad to go and work for somebody else for a few years just to see what real life is about and actually the obstacles you're going to face and the challenges, et cetera. Because in the end, you're going to start hiring people. And you have to have experience to do that. And what's the right people? Because it's costly to make mistakes there. <clears throat> then the second part of your question is, what's that going to mean for um, my kids and their kids is what I hear you say. Not much. I believe they should go to school, get the best education, and then go to work as hard as they can. Okay. Um, I, I believe that we have phenomenal success here, and we will give back to the community as much as we can. Uh, next is Cedric, table 38. Hey, how's it going? Cedric Harrison, founder of uh, Support the Poor Foundation. Um, first off, thank you so much for bringing your business to uh, Wilmington. It's definitely uh, a good thing as bringing businesses to the area. But we also like to uh, see if you know some of the businesses you know that's coming to Wilmington are thinking and uh, making sure that they're consciously uh, thinking about the people, the natives that's here in Wilmington. So I heard you talk about um, how you guys kind of have an intention to recruit from the university. A uh, majority of the students at the university are from out of town, so I was just wondering if your business had a focus or a thought or any plans in the future of um, trying to directly impact or create a program that can empower uh, people to actually be high qualifying employees for your business. Um, so it's, it's ironic, but Jonathan Rowe is our head of marketing. He actually used to run um, the, uh, what was it called? Uh, at the university, the, yes. Um, and so at the university, he was involved there. So we're actually heavily involved at the university in deciding what kind of students we need and what skill sets we need. But do understand a complex company like Encino has got not only programming skills needed or product management, etc. We've got salespeople, we've got accountants, we've got marketing people. Um, so there's a very vast array of skill sets and qualifications we look for. <clears throat> I'll also urge you to think about this. Skill set in education is one thing. Attitude is something totally different. Um, a positive attitude overcome many, many things. And, and we actually hire heavily for an attitude 
glass half full people versus half empty, um, can do, put me in coach, all those simple things you learn when you play sports, okay? Um, so we are open. We've hired a lot from locally. We prefer it. We like it. We like people who come here and actually want to stay in town. So yes, um, we are in touch with the university at all times. Let me take one. Uh, next question is uh, Keith, table 37. Hello, Keith White with Colonial Leadership Development. My question was, how does a online venture compete with the personal and social nature of a brick and mortar type of store? Sorry, I, did you get that? I think he was asking, how's the, the online, uh, Rick, tell me if I'm interpreting this wrong, how's the, the, the trending towards online banking competing with the, the experience of the brick and mortar? <clears throat> yes. Um, so here's how we foresee banking will morph into the future. Um, you know, the same is happening to retail, by the way, <clears throat> is that I would call most community banks and banks as we know it as full service banks. In other words, they offer, offer loans, deposits, they can do commercial, retail, small business on both sides of that. <clears throat> the biggest disruption is actually coming from point solution banks. If you look at pure online banking, um, they have limited product sets. You look at typically a credit card company going on its own. You get small business loans like OnDeck. You look at SoFi, which is student lending. So you're continuously going to fight those. Plus, um, your typically smaller bank is going to fight the big four. JP Morgan Chase will invest $9 billion in technology per year going forward. So how can you compete with that? <clears throat> you compete by maximizing your relationship with every customer you touch. And therefore, you have to have a blend of technology and the local presence. And the interaction between humans from the bank and the customer is going to be on a limited basis only when I want consulting. So think about it, because I don't have to go to the branch anymore. I can transfer money, pay a bill. I can do anything I can on my phone. The only time I'm going to interact with a banker is either I have a problem or I want true financial advice. So what that's going to do is, is going to <clears throat> make for a lesser physical presence, more of a technology presence, but a much higher quality interaction the times I interact with the bank. If you look at wealth management, it's probably where it's the most prevalent today. <clears throat> what you'll see is, in the old days, you could go to a bank, get a wealth manager, they'll come and see you once a quarter with some printouts and pie charts and tell you how your investments are doing. Today, you can go to Fidelity and Schwab and do it all online and run all the same simulations in the complex tools if you have the wherewithal to do that. That's called high tech. The first model is high touch. The expectation of the consumer is converging into this high touch and high tech environment, especially if it's a high net worth in, uh, environment. So what we're seeing is that it's more limited interaction, much higher quality consulting approach that's going to happen, even the consumer level. Instead of product pricing, you're going to price by customer and customer profitability. So it's going to be a bundle of products as opposed to single point solutions. And that's the only way I foresee whether it's a retailer or a bank, you're going to compete in the future. Um, and, and the cloud is actually the democratization of technology. Because you pay, in our case, per user, if you're a small bank, you pay a lot less. So today, the same technology that Bank of America used for highly complex transaction is available to a community bank. So there's no more excuse you can't give the technology. It's actually available on a play-per-play -play basis and allow smaller banks to deploy exactly that same sophisticated technology. So now it's about that mindset. Am I willing to consume it and go through the cultural chains and actually attack the market that way? So you mentioned um, the amount of money JP Morgan is investing in, in banking technology. And we all know that in the recent BB&T SunTrust merger, you know, part of that announcement was the, they were saying they were going to invest $100 million on technology and innovation. Does that type of um, a, looking towards investment in that area, but also this trend we're seeing of consolidation over uh, the recent years in the U.S. banking industry. How does that impact you guys? Is that beneficial? Does the, does the merger activity uh, not help you guys because of the You always hope you're on the winning side of a merger. <laughs> um, and uh, Are you I'm guys? very proud to say that SunTrust <laughs> is a good customer. 
And um, the indications are there, and I hope that the combined entity will actually utilize Encino. It is by far the more modern technology, and we've had great success transforming the SunTrust commercial side of the bank. Um, so I'm very positive about that. Uh, it's very interesting. In the old days, when one bank would buy another one, the acquirer would just take their stamp of technology and put it right into the new acquiring, OK? We have a number of examples where smaller banks that were our customers got acquired, and then the big bank would actually take that footprint of Encino into the big bank. So we have a, a fair number of examples where that's happened. And I do believe sometimes banks get acquired because they have better technology. Um, so to us, it's not really a big threat. There can be exceptions to that rule, of course. Uh, but it's, we, we've been very fortunate so far. And is that a larger shift that you're seeing in terms of this um, increased intention and funding towards innovation and technology? <clears throat> we are seeing consolidation because scale matters of what you can afford. Um, so I'm seeing it. It's very interesting. If you look at the banking segmentation, there's about 4,000 banks below 500 million in assets. Um, I don't see too much activity there. The banks are too small to really be meaningful to be acquired. Between 500 million in assets and 10 billion is your traditional larger community bank. I see some activity going on there because they all want to get above the 10 billion mark. And then if you go 10 to about 250 billion, um, there's going to be quite a bit of activity. That's highly competitive. Okay, and where else are you guys seeing where you're headed to in the future, whether it's in markets or new products or? Um... So the first seven years of the company, we focused on building this holistic architecture to literally can run the bank on a single platform, whether it's retail, consumer, small business, and commercial. We believe, and we call that the agile enterprise. That is where you truly can change your business processes on the fly without calling in Sino or needing programmers. Um, which was, was quite a feat. I believe the next five to seven years is going to be all about machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. And what that's going to do is it's going to free up the employees of the bank from mundane tasks like re-entering data and scanning documents, much more into a higher value role, which is consulting and consumer focused. Um, so we are now heavily focused on AI, machine learning, and robotics and injecting that into every part of that bank operation. So what would that look like for a bank customer? So I heard a story today that uh, McDonald's is investing in AI for the drive through So you go through the drive through and it tells you what you're recommended <clears throat> based on the time of day and the time of season and how many hamburgers you've eaten that month. So like if you're in banking, what, is, what does AI mean for the typical uh, consumer? Well, I'm not sure I want that app from McDonald's, <laughs> but in any case, uh, so, so yes. The way we see, if you look at the consumer, you're going to start seeing offers from banks similar to Amazon. If you go there to open an online account, let's say you open checking, it'll start going through and say, people with your profile also opened a debit card, a credit card, a savings account, etc. Okay? Then it'll take that full package and price it holistically. And, and then you can start picking your pricing models. You want free checking, a low interest rate loan, and your deposit rate will be slightly lower because the bank has to make profit. So it'll be a customer profitability model. That's how the consumer experience will become different. Okay. If you're a bank employee, what you're going to find is, as you maybe underwrite a loan, <clears throat> the, the system will start making suggestions to you. If you're underwriting a veterinarian in Des Moines, Iowa, it'll tell you local economic conditions. The last 10 veterinarians we underwrote in Des Moines, Iowa, actually, here's the metrics, here's the financials. Here's what you have to look at, the propensity of the loan to go bad, etc. So you'll start seeing these levels of intelligence injected at each of those. Another one is, you know, lots of bank employees spend time re-entering financial data. You get the financial statements, you get the tax forms, etc. Those will be scanned, and we've got programmatic approaches, optical character recognition, to actually read those documents, digitize the data. We get to 85, 90% accuracy. So it's a massive shift of labor on doing data entry into more of, I would say, an intelligent workforce. And then I saw you, they actually, you guys had a display at Cape Fear Museums, had their STEM night um, last week in the After Hours event, and they were showing that, uh, that scraping yes. uh, program. But then they also had, uh, I guess, like a machine learned chatbot that would, That's right. uh, it's basically learning the, the <clears throat> language of um, uh, underwriters. Is that? Yes. Something you guys are working and on. And so at Encino, we've got this thing called the Encino community. Uh, think of a Facebook purely for Encino users. Um, 
Today, we have over 90,000 bankers using it. And everyone who uses the system has some experience. And they either give us feedback, they make a support call, um, they may talk to an senior employee, somebody may write a white paper on some experience or the best practice they have to do. All of that data goes into the database in the back. And so next time when you come onto the system and you may say, um, Nick, it's Encino's uh, IQ is called Nick. Nick, how do I do collateral? Then Nick will go into that database and begin to understand not only the system, but the experiences of past people using it and actually take you there and start educating you how to do that task, which in the past would have been training, a what if analysis, some videos, and then by the time you get there, you forgot what you learned. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's a lot more interactive, a lot more like your phone. Um, is what we're seeing the future to be. Oh. I have a chat bot. <clears throat> it's called Rob up here in the front. He says we have another um, question from the audience before we run out of time. I won't tell you what to order at McDonald's, don't worry. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of questions about, uh, and by the way, this will be the last one because we have to wrap up, but we've had a lot of questions about how to grow <clears throat> technology companies in Wilmington, so I'll summarize it as a two-part question. So one, uh, how do you raise money if you're not friends with Chip? <laughs> and two, how do you uh, scale quickly? Um, the first one is how do you raise money? You know, it's very interesting. The, the, number one, there is a massive amount of private equity money out there, okay? So they have big funds to deploy and they look for these um, opportunities. Uh, the first thing is that your company must have credibility. So there's these different stages. There's an angel stage, which is you need somebody to get you off the ground, okay? And that's where Live Oak was instrumental. <clears throat> and then, the first time we raised outside money, um, we actually went to people who understand the banking industry, showed the concept, and actually gained credibility. And when you look at those people, they will tell you, the first thing they look at is the operator. Do they believe that the person in charge of that thing can scale it, actually understand the industry, understand the customer's issues? And, and have the wherewithal to run the company. That's number one. They always look at the management teams. The second thing is, is your idea a big idea? Is it going to be big enough for them to make real money? Um, and so we got early investments from Wellington Management, which Nick Adams actually invest more into banking as opposed to technology. Uh, and that was quite instrumental. Um, and so what I would say is make sure that you get connected to the right people and the right funds and actually understand the economics behind what are the terms you're signing up for. What if you work for 10 years, create a massive company, and they get all the money? I mean, so you have to balance that. Um, in our case, everything is common stock, which is quite extraordinary. Um, that there's a single investor with preferences or can get the money first, OK? And so it is understanding the environment and actually get connected to the right people. The other one is proximity. You know, New York is a direct flight up. Um, if you're here, don't go to the West Coast. It's a big trip. It takes lots of time. And by the way, over there, they believe all the smart people are over there. Okay? Uh, and we like the people here who understand. You know, great things can happen on the East Coast as well and in places like Wilmington. Um, when it comes to scaling, if I look back over the company, um, there's two concepts that still stays with me. The first one is you get tempted to build things outside of your comfort zone because the grass always looks greener. And we had the discipline to say, no, we're going to stay with commercial lending until we're the best and we can scale up. So for five years, it's all we built is commercial and origination. And we took that from community banking to SunTrust to Bank of America. OK, so it came all the way up. Um, and then once we had that foothold in the market, we were truly a market leader, we jumped to something ancillary. And, and there's many books about this, but it is all about becoming a market leader in something before you expand your market. Otherwise, you'll have a small market presence in 100 different places, and you're never anybody. Once you're a market leader, there's a certain momentum behind it that the competition can't stop, because you're recognized for what you've done. Um, and then the final one is people. You either have a passion for people or you don't. And if you have a passion for people and you believe in them and you focus on your culture, it will happen by itself because I've got 600 people growing this thing. It, you know, I, I like to joke there and say I'm just a figurehead. Um, but it is, 
extraordinary how the young people, once they believe and they understand the mission, direction you're going in, what they can do for you and the magic that will happen every day. Okay, and speaking of your people, just to wrap up before we run out of time, um, I asked several of my insider sources at Encino what I should ask you today. And without prompting, several of them said, and I have no idea what this means, that's why I'm intrigued. They said, ask Pierre why there's so many alligators around the office. <laughs> so you so that, that Yeah, that's work. interesting. So um, <clears throat> a bunch of us went hunting in East Texas, uh, duck hunting. And um, you know, you hunt in the morning, you hunt in the afternoon. What do you do all day long? OK, so two guys went out, and they killed an alligator. And about three weeks later, they call us and said, the alligator head is available. Do you need this? And without thinking, I said, yeah, send the alligator head. You know, we'll put it there in the conference room or something. Without knowing what we're going to get, OK? And so the alligator head came. It's a nice big one. And then we left it there and literally didn't think about it again until customers started asking, so what is this about? And you know, without thinking, I said, well, that means around here, we eat the competition, OK? <laughs> we, we, we literally. That's how focused we are. We want to be a big company. OK, we eat the competition. And then Corey, the guy who ran this thing, called us again. He said, I have a second one. It's a bigger alligator. I said, send it. We got that. <laughs> and, and so it literally became this culture in the company. That's how focused we are. And so last year, or the year before, it's 14 months ago, I gave each of my direct reports a little alligator head like this to have on their desk as well to remind them every day. Because if you look at our values, it says every day bring your A game. You know, when you enter that door in the morning, it must be like you're going on the field. And you're going to win that game, OK? That's what this is about. Um, it's a high energy group. I'm very proud of them. It's a lot of special people. <laughs> it's a bleaker answer than I thought it was going to huh? be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so from unicorns to alligators, this has been Animal Wild Kingdom Hour with Pierre Nodé. I want to thank all of you guys for, for coming and for you for spending your lunch hour with us. I hope you've learned uh, a lot and taken away some. And Rob has a couple more announcements about the, the rest of the, the event today. Thank you for having me. <laughs>